And we're happy that's all working sound wise, aren't we? We're good before. I mean, it's. <clears throat> Morning, Len. Have you got enough cushioning? I need another. What do you need? I think I might. I'm a bit. Yeah, can I sort this little one out for a little print one, obviously? Right. Shall we? Shall we? Shall we? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, just give me um, a few sentences, so if you tell Kate um, where you got your earrings from. Is that from. nice to me? Tell you exactly you tell what I think of you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, where are we? Sound levels? Yeah. Hello just... Kate, how are you doing? I must say you're looking particularly neutral today. <laughs> now we're being recorded, so I can't give you yeah, my true and proper reply. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to have another drink of water? Is my chocolate baby all clicky? That was that 100% that yeah. chocolate? Yeah, that 95 was in that one. Oh, I tell you what, turbo powered all the way, yeah. That's quite full on, isn't it? I buy 70. Oh, I really like 70. That's but... from the beginning. <laughs> Is there any facet of life in which Sophie cannot find a way to insult them? <laughs> topical and design crimes oh we've got more we have got a stack <laughs> and we're recording at Sophie's house today so I shall be reporting on whether she has committed the crime in question I'll let you know <laughs> I'm not sure she has <laughs> I'm sure you'll find something oh I will find something for sure so Kate yes new books we've got a little bevy of a stack here and also some printed off pdfs because it's that hot off the press. Where have I even managed to get? Oh, I'm just going to check my post box and see if one was there. Can I, go I think the post's on strike. <laughs> so oh, I, don't, I think that's the, the point. One. They don't come twice in the country, do they? they only come I don't think they come twice anywhere now, love. So I'm just going to have a quick look. Go on then. Okay. So, out of the so many new books that have come out, we always like spoiled for choice, but we have narrowed it down to a book by the Instagrammer Design Soda Ruthie, Ruth Matthews, called Own Your Zone. Siobhan Murphy, More is More Decor, Sarah Jane Axelby, Interior Portraits, Emily Henson, Create, and Marbling by Zena Shah. Is that five or four? I've lost count already. Are we on five books? That's this five is, books. This is like a mad movie in a do three. Well, exactly. Mega, 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 mega book haul. Speak! <laughs> but it's a really nice time of year to treat yourself to a yeah. new book, I think. You know, this is a time of year where we're thinking perhaps of refreshing our home, getting new inspiration. Dare I say the C word? What? A little crimbo around the corner. So, oh, that uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> so some of these books could find on your Christmas wish list. It's a good haul. And we've got a good mixture. We've got some which deliver hard-hitting interior design advice and some which are just a nice bit of fun, creative escapism. So which one should we do first? Well, I've, I've got Ruthie's in front of me. Go so on, should we go, go with that? Go. Own Your Zone. I love this book. Do you like the title? Own Your Zone. That's quite strong, isn't it? It's quite strong, but... Do you know what I like about it? It's a book that's got proper content. Mm. I just had a bit of a flick through and it's one of those books where you feel like there's something on every page that, that is relevant or useful. And one of the things she talks about, which I think is so important in the introduction, is democratising design 
why your house is a home, not a magazine. And it may feel like a statement of the blue and obvious, but I think we've got so caught up in social media and looking at homes on Instagram that, that I think we forget that we we have to, you know, furnish and decorate our places for us and not, yeah. not for Instagram. And so she talks about, I think 13 years ago, I'm just going to have to read it here, but she used to read high-end interior magazines religiously when she started her blog. And she was very aware of products labelled price on application. Yes, the POA. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> Step away from the POA. But I remember, probably not quite 13 years ago, I think we just moved into our old house. It was 12 years ago. And uh, seeing a copy of L Decoration land on the doorstep and there was a big tagline in it which said, you know, affordable shell, a deep dive into shelving. And I thought, this is brilliant. I've moved into a house with no storage. Let me up the shelving. That's how you get your cakes, isn't it? What's inside? There was not a shelf in that section that was less than £1,500. I was like, this, this, is, this is not, yeah, this is not shelving I can do business with, you know, bookshelf. Yes. It was, and so I totally get, you know, where Ruth is coming from with this, you know, that the, this stuff is expensive. And, you know, she talks about her high end tastes and a high street yeah, budget. Yeah, and yeah. how do we do it? You know, and she says here, and I'm, I'm reading it. I was bored of being affronted by magazine articles that told me a £200 dining chair was a bargain. Times six, this was my monthly net wage at the time, never mind the budget for design. So I well understood that access and affordability are relative terms. And she then goes on, and I think this is really interesting, that the fields, how narrow the background is of a lot of interior designers, they come from the same sort of backgrounds. So they are deciding what's good taste because they're they're similar okay. people. And I think that's a really interesting point, you know, who's who's defining taste, yeah. you know? And she says she began to wonder if there was a connection between the price of these professional courses that, you know, where you learn to be an interior designer and the, the people who can go on them. Right, so right, right. I think that's a really interesting starting point. Well, I think, I mean, I think that's well established, isn't it? That historically yeah. interior design has been really elitist. And we were all made to believe that only wealthy people could afford an interior designer. And what Ruthie is saying is only wealthy people could afford to train to be an interior yes, designer. Take it back even further. <laughs> yeah. But the, and I mean, the book is beautiful. It's it's beautifully photographed. Well, this is where I can chip in because okay. everybody knows. You've not read the words. You've just looked you're at the You're a picture. reader. I'm a flicker. And oh yes, mouth watering. Yeah. Mouth watering. She has lifted um, inspiration from. All of my favourite Instagrammers are on there. There's loads of homes inside that I recognise. But she's picked out... I mean, she says, <laughs> you know, we shouldn't aspire to have magazine-worthy interiors. And then she's picked some of the most <laughs> magazine-worthy <laughs> interiors of Instagram. Yes. There we go. We'll let that slide. We still yeah. like to look at nice, clean houses. Um, all the pictures and the sort of general vibe aesthetically from this book is well put together. Yeah. It's not messy. It's not shabby. It's not shonky. It's elegant, it's actually. Elegant, but punchy as well yes. I'm pleased to report there's a lot of colour in this yes. book um, so I think it's if you like a well put together well considered <laughs> magazine worthy I know Ruby's going to help me for saying this but that is what the book looks like yeah then um then it's nice but and yeah because she's using instagrammers and not interior designers homes it all feels it feel more very achievable, accessible yeah she's actually it's it's rammed with with interesting advice and I've just so yeah what are we going to learn picked out book? a few well We've all we've all been asked, and we all talk about this notion of the red thread. How you get the cohesiveness and flow in your homes, in your decor. Given that you do not want to paint every room the same colour, so she has quite a nice little trick I really like, which is just imagine your house without any of the doorways, and just see then how the rooms. Oh, what if you took the doors off? If you took the doors off, I was going to say without any doorways, you wouldn't get very far from your house. <laughs> <laughs> Take the doors off. Um, and she's just saying, if you think about that, you then get a sense of how the rooms flow together and how they look, because mm. you can see through all the spaces. And then that helps you transition between the rooms, so that if you have, for example, one room that's painted pink, you don't want a second room that's painted pink, but you might have some pink accessories in that other room. And mm. of course, if you didn't have a door, you would see them. So you're and quite that's quite a good way to get that flow. Thing, right? yeah. I mean, interestingly, we're sat here in my living room, and I've got those sort of acid lemon yellow doors from my pale pink living room into my rich sort of lazuli living room. 
And I love the way that that bright pink looks with the pale pink in here, but I love it even more set against the blue of the hallway. So even painting your doorways a contrast makes a colour. Different. But really also nice you make it. that point, and obviously I'm pointing off camera for those of you who might be watching it on YouTube now, um, you've got a cobalt blue hall, and yet as we sit here against the yellow door, you've got a lot of candles in that cobalt blue, so you have yeah. brought the hall colour through into here. So I, I and like there's always that a yellow idea. vase on the hallway yeah. table as well. Which and then she talks me. about punches of colour and she, she likes the half painted wall if you're feeling nervous about doing a whole room in a strong colour. But there's a great photograph in the book where someone has just painted across the top of the skirting board. So I mean it's literally an inch or two centimetres of neon Ooh. orange. Mm -hmm. And it's a really nice little pop and then she showed it juxtaposed with another room where there's a, a, a neon orange little stool that's been painted. So there's, there's clever ideas. And I think one of the things, this is where we come back to the own your zone, is that there's been a lot of wall taking down in recent years. That's a conversation for another time. Are you a fan of walls or not? A lot of people living in open plan spaces. How do you zone that when you haven't got walls to paint? And one of her tips is, if you've got a beam or the steel supporting joint, use that as where your colour changes. So you might do a tonal colour or you can do a different colour, but go up to that beam in the ceiling and make that your stopping point. So there's lots of practical advice and I feel like there's lots of advice that I haven't necessarily read Anywhere else. else. It feels imaginative, it feels interesting, and it looks beautiful. This is a good book. Buy this book, everybody. Yes, yeah, you're a fan. Gets I'm a the, fan. It gets the KWS big tick, and I love the pictures. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> right, on to the next one. What do you want to do Just next? before we do that, sorry. Um, because the mic stands are on wooden floor, they're okay. picking up the knocking from the uh, arms. I think it was alright just to let it go. But uh, do you have like a rug I can like a small floor cover I can pop underneath them or do you want to underneath both these chairs? No, under the mic stand specifically. Oh right. Do you just want a blanket? I mean yeah, a blanket, you've got like that, a blanket that'd be in perfect. Here. I think that'd be the quickest way of doing it. And just bang your elbow slightly on the contrast. We just try not to do so much banging. Right, Siobhan's book I have I can go into your house book. Okay, just, just bang your arm for me. Much better. Okay, thank cool. you. Am I too close to the mic? No, you're fine. Okay. Uh, and we're still rolling, so whenever you're ready. So you were doing a, what should we do next? Right, I'm going to put that down for continuity and then we'll fade back in. Right, right what should we do next? Uh, talk to me about Siobhan's book. Oh, more is more decor! <laughs> You know I'm going to love this. I think I'm you probably I'm mostly going to love this because I love Siobhan with all my heart. I think, uh, I, think I might be a bit frightened of it. She is one of the best humans on the planet. She is one of my favourite people. She was a runner-up on the Great Interior Design Challenge, which is BBC. Um, interior Design Masters. Oops. Oh, get it right, Nat. Get it right, get it right. <clears throat> Slip of the tongue. She was runner-up on Interior Design Masters um, and her star has been in the ascendant, meteoric, ever, meteoric ever since. She's um, got her own TV show, I think, in the pipeline. She pops up on Stuff's Pack Lunch and her Instagram account just brings all the joy. So this is the book. And this basically goes to show that maximalism isn't just an interior decoration style it's a way of life yes it's a whole lifestyle it's a whole yeah. lifestyle Absolutely. this is i think this this is um the kind of cell on the back which i'll read out to give you a flavor are you ready to banish the beige ditch the drab and throw the interiors rule book out the window buckle up kws <laughs> She spent all morning telling me how beige and neutral I am, and now I'm getting shouted out by the blurb on a book. I mean, seriously. I tell you what, we are coming for you. Me and Siobhan, it's amusing. Right, she says, come with me on a magical journey into the wonderful world of maximalism. I'll show you how to work elements of your wardrobe. Oh, I'm trying to take the side step back. 
hobbies and passions into your home decor, how to play around with colour and pattern, which maximalist influences to draw inspiration from and where to source the best items. Most importantly, I'll dispel the myths that are commonly associated with maximalism and encourage you to be fearless in your approach to interiors. It's time to find your confidence and curate a space that fills you with joy. I hope you enjoy the ride. Woohoo! And a ride! It, it is a ride. It is. Yes. I mean, this is, I mean, there's loads of great copy in here and tips, but really for me, this is a visual feast. Every page is laden in drenched colour, style. Well, even the pages of the book. Oh, there's not even a there's white, a, there's page, not a white page in this book. Page. Yeah. You know, cerise pink, pistachio. You're going to see loads of your favourite Instagrammers in here as well as um, fashion stylists. Funny enough, I'm not in it. <laughs> yeah, I can't well. think why. Well, yeah. I don't know. Hang with it. I wrote a little section for the. But yeah, there's Jonathan Adler's in here, Agnes Apple, you know, all the kind of like people you would expect uh, to see some of her fellow uh, design masters. Old Paula Sutton, of course, Hill House Vintage. But those are the modern influences. What mm -hmm. I liked about it was that she's gone back to the sort of, I can't remember the phrase, but the, the sort of original influences, if you like. And she's she's looking at Liberace. Yeah, and Liberace. Bar, she's got Elvis Presley and Graceland. I Jane love Lansford. that because we never sort of throw it back to that. And that's what I think is really, you know, I love that section of the book. Let's have a look at, let's have a look at how Liberace did maximalism. Oh, Dorothy the, Draper, of course, the famous Beverly Hills. Gosh, Beverly Hills, 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 Hills I mean, look at this, Liberace's there in a frothy cup, hot tub with a couple of gold swan neck taps. Surrounded by gold. There's cherubs are going go. Yeah, fabulous. Um, it, it, it is, honestly, this is such a, joyous uplifting uh, book and if anybody can write a book like this Siobhan completely can because like I said she completely lives and breathes this, uh, what, what this I like book. about that is that you know we talk a lot about the rigor of interior designs or knowing the rules so you can break them and I think what Siobhan is saying is that if you love it if it's a piece of you then it will work just do it and she's absolutely testament to that she does what she loves she owns it and it works because she has complete confidence in what she's done and you know and she's not classically trained she's not classically trained. Remember, i'm going to be honest in, with you yeah. it's a bit much for me <laughs> in, in, in places um you know it, you would be surprised if i said said it wasn't but i completely admire that you know she is telling her story through her decor through her dress it is completely true to her and whether you like that style or you like a bit less the key takeaway is that make it you yeah as long as it's is your truth and tells your story you won't go wrong and just have the confidence to own it and, and look i think she is talking to the converted here though to be fair when you look at the front cover leopard print huge pair of like yes a piece of you hot red lips i think you know if you're pulling this off the bookcase she's already got your eye yeah let me just read what maximal is for her she says it's all about using color patterns and textures in a happy and joyful way i think that's the headline it's about showcasing your personality and the things you love both in the way you dress and in the way you decorate your home it's layered and personal and it tells a story it's decorating from the heart going with your gut and not worrying about what anyone else will say it's all the trims, all the feathers, all the fringes, and all the tassels. Right, so I'm going with half the feathers, <laughs> half the trim, half the tassels, and half the sequins. So, but totally going with what makes you happy. Yeah, I'm definitely. here for that. Yeah. I mean, she goes on, she, and I think this is the key to a maximalist kind of sensibility. She says, I like stuff. <laughs> I like stuff. Understatement of the year. She has trinkets, knickknacks, collections. I like to surround myself with items that I find beautiful or that hold memories for me. A waving cushion I picked up in a souk in Marrakesh. A book I found at a swap and meet in Santa Monica. Are just as important as an expensive Jonathan Adler vase or any precious piece of jewellery as they have a memory and fondness attached to them. Having said that, she goes on, I am definitely more selective these days about the things I buy and bring into the house. My organiser said, and Ooh. Amanda's like, Yes, no. I know. I, know. I, I need to know more. Is that her husband? I know. She's got a professional she says, organizer right her. We need to. I mean, we need to find this out. We need to call in, please. We will report back. <laughs> 
Because my organiser said something the other day that totally resonated with me, and which is so simple, just because you think it's nice doesn't mean you have to own it. She says that was quite the revelation. So now when I look at something, I ask myself, do I really need it? Do I really love it? And do I have a place for it? You see, I don't need an organiser, I just need you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need that. The Get rid of voice that. of doom. Do you always do you always <laughs> shall we move on? Yes, let's, let's, let's. But anyway, great fun. Congratulations, Siobhan. I love this book. It is a joy. And if you've got any fellow Maximus in your life, life, pop that under their tray. They're gonna love it. I can't believe you're actually talking about the C word. I thought it was a joke. <laughs> um which one should we do now? We're gonna create next, aren't we? Oh, Emily. Emily Henson's new book. She's written lots of books. She's yes. an interior stylist, super successful, and she's just moved, I think, to Margate. She's moved out of London. London. And she's doing up a bungalow in Margate, so you can find that and follow along. Um, the book is called Create, Inspiring Homes That Value Creativity Before Consumption. I mean, we are that's the title we're for now, we're isn't it? We're Absolutely, in. we're in. And I'm going to hold it here, and for those of you who are watching, I mean, that is a gorgeous book. Gorgeous. I mean, what you can rely on with Emily, because of her background as a, as a photo shoot stylist, she's got a great eye. I mean, a lot of the projects that are photographed for this book are people's homes. Yeah. But she's got a great eye. And I think overall, actually, it's quite interesting aesthetically. You know, we've already talked about Ruth's book and Siobhan's book, and they have a very strong visual presence. This does, too. Um, and you know, our, our other really best selling books of Emily's, I'm thinking of like the Bohemian book she yeah. did. She's got a much more boho, rustic, this is rough I and love ready. This. Yeah. It's muted, it's soft pinks, it's I mean, rich even greens, it's colour, slightly it's vintage wood that's a bit distressed, a lot of texture. It's a lot of the Her interiors, in there, yes. So, Ruth Matthews' book is much Quite tidier, clean. you feel like the cushions are, are, are more lined up. Whereas Emily's aesthetic would be to have the same amount of cushions, but they'd be slightly jiggled or a bit squashed mm. as if somebody mm. just got up um, and, and there'd be a sheepskin rug underneath them. So it's, it's, if you it's have more, more of a If you have more of a boho sensibility. Yeah. A but I, it's a beautiful ready. book. I love all these colours, these soft colours. But I think this book's also got real heart and I think, again, is really, really timely. You know, she talks about decorating in a creative and conscious way. Um, it's another book that's going to help you find your own style, for sure, but I think have a flick through the pictures and you'll know what that style's likely going to be. And sort of helps you find out a way of going about it. Again, it's packed through loads and loads of good advice. I particularly love her paragraph about decorating slowly. She says, once you embrace the mindset of slow decorating, you'll find that your style emerges organically over time. Living in a space that is unfinished leaves the door open allowing inspiration to strike and ideas to evolve. Often costly mistakes can be avoided by simply taking your time. And she says, this is written from a desk in the middle of a, build amid a building site in my own new house. And she makes that point as well, which, which yes, decorating slowly is a really good idea. The other thing, and I think this is a real mental problem for people, about balancing the cost of what to buy with getting it right. And she says, just forget that idea of the, the forever home. Yeah, I love that Even concept. if you think you never want to move again, forget it. Because as soon as you say, this is my forever home, this is the last kitchen sink I'm ever going to buy, <laughs> you're paralysed yeah. by getting it wrong, you know, because you're constantly looking for the perfect one. And we all know you go 10 years down the line and you're still using a bucket in the kitchen because you haven't been able to commit. So just park that and, you know, don't look for perfection. And allow things to change and we were talking before we started recording weren't we about color and and me doing my new house and everybody says you know when you move into a new house you should just either paint it white or live with it for a year and get to understand it and see what the house wants and it will talk to you and you know that's a very noble idea in principle but most of us don't want to live in something that 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 doesn't suit us or that is ugly or dilapidated for a long time um and there's a lot to be said for just finding a colour you like, maybe in cheap paint, and just slapping it on the walls mm. a bit. Why you find your way round, do I need to move a wall, or how am I going to make it work? And then and then you can come to stronger colours over time. So when we moved into the last house, which was rental flats that we had to convert back to a single house, 
we painted it all in windborne white, which is a kind of warm, chalky, pearl and ball colour, which I thought was going to be the colour. I thought I was having my <coughs> scent. So sorry. Oh, oh, no, 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 do worry. you need some more? <coughs> There's some milk all on the floor. <coughs> oh, you've been too long. <coughs> you must always go. Sorry. When we moved into our last house, when we moved into our last house, which was rental flats that we had to convert back into a single dwelling, so obviously we had to do some decor. We painted it all in a kind of warm off-white, and I loved it. I thought that would be it. But actually, as the house, the rooms were completed and the storage was built, the colour crept in, and I ended up, as you know, anyone who follows me on Instagram will know, with these deep, dark chocolate mm -hmm. walls and a pink bedroom and a dark green bathroom. So the... The colour will find you, and yet if you think, I've got to find my forever colour right now, mm. you'll never paint anything. Well, I've, and this is the sort of mantra I think that Emily's going with, is take your time, and this allows in creativity. This book called Create is all about creative interiors. For her as well, that's about being quite organic, make, do, and mendy, yeah. uh, mismatched. Um, these are, This is all the essence of the book. I love here where she talks about creative contrast. I think this is a really nice concept. She says... Some of the most memorable homes I've visited over the years are those with a playful approach to contrast, coupling new with old, handmade and chain store, pop of colour set against neutrals. It's experimental and intriguing and personal, all the things I love. So I think that's again about not using the recipe, not going by the rule book, not being too tight. Being well, and I think it's, it's about... That, that mismatching thing is really interesting because we've spoken before about, you know, not having a three-piece suite. You know, it's about that sort of, it's the antithesis of kind of add to cart. It's like, I like that chair, so I'm going to buy that chair, but I'll just buy one for budget or because they've only got one in that colour or because I'm not sure if I'd like it enough to have three matching. And then you buy another chair at a later date that goes with it because you trust your instinct to like sort of colours that work together. So you build it up over time and that's also how you create a home. I, I never forget years ago going to visit someone's house and they, they'd they wanted everything new for their new house and it never worked because it just had that feeling that they'd gone around the virtual shop and, mm -hmm. and just added, I'll have three of those and two of those and a couple of those and one of those and there's a rug and there's some curtains and Bob's your uncle done. And yes. they put it in a room. But it felt very two-dimensional. Well, and it only ever was going to look like a shop showroom. Yeah, right. Because there was no sort of time and soul into it. And I think now that, you know, we're, we're beginning to think much more carefully about how we consume, how we shop. Yeah. You know, so and being more conscious as well. Being much more conscious. So the creativity, you don't have to be panicked if you think you're not a creative person. If you don't work in a creative field and you worry that you're not a creative person, you need to kind of let that go because just buying things over time that you've taken the time to think about whether you like them and how you will use them, that will be your creativity. Mm. And that is how you will create a home that has a vibe that is you. I think it is, I think this is what this book's about, this good vibe decorating. Yeah. You get the good vibes from the photography. And again, I love her soulful way of writing. Here she says, supplementing new pieces with some reclaimed or repurposed items is better than doing nothing. It's not easy to shop consuming new things completely. Oh no, I've run out of page here. Hold on, hold on. What page does it, does it say? Yeah, because it's cropped oh, off. I've got the book here, but fine. Wait, can you see the page? Creative number? contrast. Is it near the beginning? There you go. <coughs> yeah, let me just read this bit. And then we'll go to the next Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like here she says, supplementing new pieces with some reclaimed or repurposed items is better than doing nothing. Decorating this way allows a huge amount of freedom. Freedom to buy that random vintage sculpture at a charity shop because you know it would look brilliant on your modern box shelf. Freedom to put a too small lampshade on a too big lamp just because you like it that way. Freedom to hang a lilac sink on a mint green tiled wall purely because you're bored of ubiquitous white metro tiled bathrooms. She says our homes are the one place where we can freely express ourselves, our creativity, our ingenuity, without fear of judgment. So get mixing. Oh, love that. I love and, and I think actually all three of these books are in their very different ways and very different styles, from that sort of clean, grown-up elegance to the maximalist riot to a more sort of modern rustic feel. Three very different books, but the message coming through from all of them is similar, and that is just 
trust yourself. Mm. Trust yourself. You know what you like. So put it in your home. And if you don't, there's a book to buy that'll help you find it. Yeah. <laughs> find yourself. Or if you don't like it, or if some if you don't like something, but you felt you had to have it or it's been there for too long, get rid of it. Yes. You know, trade it, swap it, yeah. and get something that you do love. They're, they're, all the books have the same message there, and that's a it's a good message. It's a good message. Right, slight gear change with this yes. next book. This is SJ Axelby's Interior Portraits. Now, I met Sarah on Instagram. She had a brilliant lockdown project um, on her Instagram account called uh, Room Portrait Club. And she made a pack to paint a room portrait, which is something that she, she goes into why she paints portraits, but it's very therapeutic for her. Um, and she made a commitment to do one a week, and I think I was one of the first rooms that she painted, so I feel particularly proud to have got in on the action. But since then, she's just gone stellar with this, and she created this club, and everybody else was encouraged to paint a picture of their home Brilliant. and share it on Instagram. And it was so much fun, and there is, so this is a book with no photography. I counted 89 different interior designers that she's featured in this book. It could be 90, because I like a round number, but I think it's 89. And you are in here amongst, you know, many other greats. Ben Pentreese in here, uh, Sir Vincent Graham's in here, who had Rita Koenig's in here, Luke Edward Hall's in here, uh, Kit Kemp, who again, I think, started lots off Lots of big thing. names, but also lots of names I, I had don't, don't know as well. Yeah. And, and it's be it seems me quite UK and a bit transatlantic as well. Yeah. Mainly UK, but I know that there are some American designers in here. All fairly maximalist in their sensibility, I think it's safe to say. There's no minimalist in Well, there's a lot because I think clearly when you're painting a portrait, you want something to go you at, don't you? And painting a, 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 a white minimal box is, is not going to be an interesting picture. Mm -hmm. She did a, a portrait of my office. Um, which she took from Instagram and had a photograph of it. So um, for those of you who don't remember, in the last house it had very dark, rich walls that were panelled and it had a pink velvet armchair and a zebra carpet. It was it was my maximalist room, actually. It was very small. Um, and she's so she's painted these rooms beautifully. And then there's a little interview about, you know, what do you like about this room and what colours you've used. And it's it's just a lovely book. I tell you different. what, I, I love it. So first of all, her art is gorgeous it's a real mm -hmm. celebration of beautiful interiors and also let's remember as well that oh i've got some notes on this i've had some notes yes because you were going to say something interesting yeah so i think i was going to say something interesting the next bit. <laughs> i think what's interesting is that this isn't new this sort of portraiture i mean we're so used to like photography and dare i say it sketch up and then um, do you know what i mean that's hair drawing hair yeah. drawings but actually, as she says in her introduction, the history of uh, room portraiture fascinates her. Its earliest form in the 17th century, it served to document the contents of a room, for example, a library or a collection of art or objets. It then became the fashion in England and Europe for aristocrats to commission portraits to showcase their homes, a status symbol, if you like. Um, and then obviously architects over time went on to have watercolours made of the interiors they designed. And, if, you know, while the cleverest creators now are all using all these whiz bang wallop you know computer programs i think there's still a real beautiful charm in a painterly oh i think it's lovely to see portrait. we're used to looking at the sort of stark detail of photography and particularly on social media where you can pinch in and zoom and, mm. and examine all the details and actually seeing it rendered through if you take that that notion that the camera never lies you're seeing it through an artist's eye you're seeing it through a more subjective eye it's their interpretation of your room and it's just lovely to see it you know for me to see I've seen my office on my own Instagram account you know a million times and it has been featured in the odd magazine as part of book promo or something but to see it rendered in paint that's it's just something it's got more soul it, it? yes so you think so that so the art is unquestionably gorgeous and I think it's just a lovely resurrection of this craftsmanship mm. if you like this yeah. skill the other thing I really like this book is is the interviews as you touched yeah. on um, and these little gems so she's gone to lots and lots of really established uh, interior designers and interviewed them for all kinds of like hints and tips I thought I'd pull, pull some out so for example Kath Kidston um, has been interviewed uh, her favorite color combo at the moment is red and pink we get on board with that yeah um, best styling tips add little hints of color in a room it could be a dish or a vase and flowers 
small things like that can add a huge difference in making the room. I think, you know, again, it's just these little pearls. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we get too sort of like caught up on the big statements and, um, and you know, not enough on the small details. Vicky Charles, obviously, of the Soho House fame. Vicky Charles of the Soho House is a interior designer. 20 years. I think she could have designed for some um, significant royalty as well. I bet the uh, word she, on the street. Yes. She did the uh, Sussex, not the Sussex, the Cambridges. I think I she believe. might have done the Cooneys as and well. And the Cooneys. But she now, then she set up her own business, and I believe she works with Mrs. James Corden. Yes. And actually, one of my dearest oldest friends and ex housemates works for her. So I should, we should get a scoop, shouldn't we? We yeah. should have that. And let's interview. do that. Let's, let's post note that. Anyway, um, what I love, her interview is quite short and to the point. Busy woman. Yeah. What's your design approach? Listening. Nice. Quick fix for room transformation. Clean it. I thought that was genius. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I could go on. It's a lovely again, book. It's a lovely book. It's a treaty book. And again, I think with the lovely end of the tree for someone special. Think of something that might we've got to really hammer this on now because I'm worried about Kate's train and her children being on the street. No, don't worry, yeah. don't worry. I've got to uh, change batteries and my children will not be on the street. Um, <laughs> right, we're just so for our final book, which I think sort of follows the thread of craft mm -hmm. and lovely gifts to put under the tree, um, is the book Marbling by Zena Shah. Now, I follow Zena on Instagram because she's all the joy and all the colour. All the colour. She's a genuinely lovely human. And uh, she used to be a textile designer, illustrator, stylist, teacher, art director, prop maker. She's now a content creator, need I go on, all round creative whirlwind. And she's brought out this book, which is a how-to on marbling technique. You can marble a cushion cover, your own stationery, quick frame. I've seen it on stationery, I've not seen it done on fabric, yeah. actually. Oh, you know, there's lots and lots of creative projects. So if you're somebody who likes a creative project, I'm not looking at you at this point. No, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> then I think this is a really lovely book. And we know that more and more people are drawn towards spending time meditatively mm. creating beautiful things for their home. So I thought it was worth a mention. The other reason why I thought it was a mention, not just because I love Zena and I love her colour palettes and I love, I'm not sure I'm going to get marbling anytime soon. It does sound, I mean, I've, had, I've read the book. There is a that you're not just slopping stuff around, there are techniques. No, I think I'd very much involved. like to watch someone marbling. I think that yes. would be very restful, well, watching the sort of watch. colours move through the oil. I'm here for that. I mean, I, do you remember doing it at school? I remember doing it at art, at, art, at school in the art lesson. Did you never get to do that? You never got to but do I, marbling well, I, well, listen, never say never. But what I, what, the other reason why I wanted to touch on it is it's a really big trend. Yeah. You know, the sort of marbled wallpapers. Was it custom who did the wallpapers? Now? that brand that did the amazing marbled wallpaper at like a thousand pence for meters or something it was incredible through to uh, you know Pietro Hoyman's with her fabrics yeah Susie Bellamy's done it as well the lampshades to be marbled lampshades these things so I think and it's lacquered trays I'm spotting it everywhere but it can be quite expensive so if you can do a bit of DIY well, and there's all sorts of places where you can learn to make a lampshade, aren't there? I mean, it's moving on. We've had that whole kind of Charleston thing where it's painting lampshades and mm. painting fabric and painting pearl mitts. And this is that similar idea of getting, creating your own bespoke interior so it's not off the peg. And this is using marbling as a technique. And I should probably say what it is. So marbling method is an aqueous surface pattern design that mimics natural stone. So it's got a kind of random to it it's kind of like yeah it's kind of magic in its uniqueness I suppose but w when you sort start marbling with inks and paints you're open to all the other colors and that's another section in the book she goes into the color theory the color wheel so you even you're learning not just a technique you're learning like a color that teaches you do you're going to be do. learning all about that but I thought the other thing that's quite interesting was the fact that marbling is pretty old school dating back all the way to the 12th century no less is first, it Italian? I feel like it come from Venice or oh, something. I love it. See, I love quizzing and stuff like this. <laughs> well, first reference to have been practiced by artisans in Japan. Oh, wow. So that said, it's likely to have originated much earlier than this because the techniques were kept very secretive. And so it's very difficult to trace the craft's true origins since it was rarely documented, which is quite interesting. But she says it's most well known in the city of Ego. So oh, there you go. That. You've got that as well as Persia, Turkey, India. And another uh, and other countries in its various papery 
forms. It's a stationary thing, isn't it, in Italy? Because I think Sky McAlpine, the mm. inside covers of her cookery books oh, yes, are marbled, they are marbled. And she obviously grew up in Venice. So I think maybe that's where I found that connection. Yeah. Well, well, well I want my next book to have a marbled cover well, now. I'm going to have to do it myself, clearly. I have to buy the book and learn how to do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. So our next topic is exploring the concept of really getting value for money out of our furniture. Now, Kate, I know this is something that you have given a particular amount of thought to lately. I suppose for lots of different reasons, the house moves, you're in the position of perhaps purchasing some new pieces for your home. But I think also continuing on with the thread that, you know, sustainability counts. We've got to get rid of our throwaway culture. This is a conversation that continues, continues. I mean, let's face it, we've never perhaps been more conscious of our pennies yeah. than we are right now. So I thought it'd be really interesting for you to share, because this is kind of your brain baby, if you like, of a different way of thinking about purchases that we make for our interiors. Well, yes, I mean, I think the point is, you know, we, we all know we've been in our homes a lot more over the last few years. Our homes are have to be much more multifunctional than they've ever been. There might be more people in them for more of the day, and yet they probably haven't got any bigger. And against that is the backdrop of, you need new furniture, but to come back to Emily's, uh, you know, the myth of the forever home, you can be paralysed by buying a piece of furniture and thinking, you know, has this got to last forever? I've got to justify the cost of it, you know. And I'm, I'm, I always bring interior design and purchases back to this notion of the wardrobe. You know, we do it for colours. We, everybody talks about it now with colour. We're really comfortable with the idea that, you know, if you like dressing in it then there's a good chance you would be happy to live in it because that's your sort of palette and I think you can take that a bit further and it's not just about multifunctional furniture which is good but it's about trying to identify those pieces that you can love for a long time like and adaptable is it about adapting? I don't think it has to be adaptable, but it's maybe using them in different rooms. So the, the, the fashion analogy, and I think the, the fashion people will often tell you that when you see a new top or a new dress or you need a new pair of trousers, whether you know there's a fine line between need and want, and that's not for now. But when you are buying something to wear, you should really be thinking from a sustainability point of view, am I going to wear it 30 times? But the other point is, can I make at least three outfits out of it? Mm. If you can make three different outfits out of that one new top, then it's a piece that can take up space in your wardrobe. And I like that analogy for furniture. So when you're is buying... Is this like from the office to the party? Is it that kind of outfit? Has any, have you ever gone from an office you know to a party what? and changed your clothes? Do you know what? Because I saw something on this on Instagram the other day. It said, I've been preparing my whole life yeah. to wear an outfit that takes me from the office to a party and I'm still <laughs> sitting in the house. And, 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 and I spent years carrying a whole load of makeup around because you've got to do your makeup from day to night. Never happens to on a bit of lip salve in the car. Jobs are good. So no, it's not that. It's not that at all. You, it's brilliant. the idea of buying, for example, an armchair that goes beautifully in your sitting room and that's what you need in your sitting room right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. But it is perhaps in a shape or a style that if you move house and you end up with a bigger bedroom than you thought, that will fit well in your bedroom. Or that will go in a spare room. I haven't, got, I haven't got like an orb which is going to tell me what my future house is going to look like. But it's just, if you love that piece of furniture, so if you're buying a stool, mm -hmm. stools are always great examples because a stool can be extra seating. Our producer Kate's just off camera now. She's sitting She's on, on a stool. stool which I used as a side table. You were using it as a side yes. table. You could have that pull it into the kitchen as an extra, if an extra person yeah. turns up yeah. for supper, it can go into your bedroom as a bedside table. Yeah. So it's about you those next pieces the of furniture. There yeah. you go. Well, the stool is the ultimate. Stool is the ultimate. But you can, you can take that's, that. That's your black trouser seat, isn't it? Well, oh, the stool is your black trouser. There you go. Uh, but it works with actually tables as well, small mm. tables, which you might in a small flat that might be your dining table where you can sit two or four people. If you move, that might later become your kids' 
crafting table mm. or it might or a become desk. a desk mm. or you might have a consult table which you know I fantasize about a hall wide enough for a consult table I, I hear they exist but have you never had a consult table? I never had a hall oh wide enough for a consult table gosh, but consult that table. narrow table could go behind the sofa with lamps and magazines on it yeah. and it looks could nice. be a dressing table could be a dressing table yeah. could go in the hall could also be in the bedroom as a oh we've done that one so could also be a desk and could also go in a kitchen as a small table slash breakfast bar if you haven't got room for the full table. So it's not, obviously not every piece of furniture can do this, but it's just trying to think. Is it like creating your own little bundle of heirloom furniture? Sort of thing. thing. Yeah, it's, it's your package of your furniture. So, so there's you. the purpose of it, then there is the look of it. Yeah. Okay, so is it about investing in a style that's like, for example, I know you always say mid-century goes with everything. You know. Although I have no mid-century in my house. But you it does go too. with it. I just did a whole thing on the blog about all the mid-century bits. Your mid-century dining chairs, your mid-century artichokes, oh, yes, chairs, your sort of mid-century library chairs.
washing up bowls was a design crime. So for this week's design They're crime. Not, I've got one leg on a design crime. Oh, just because you've got one, it's not a design crime. No. Oh, I see how it is. Oh, I see useful. how this podcast They're goes down. Useful. I've got it in my house, useful. therefore it's not a crime. If I had one in my house, you'd tell me it was a crime. I'm getting you one for Christmas. Oh, no, I've ruined it. I've probably bought the kitchen sink. <laughs> <laughs> So what have you got for us this week's so design crime? This week's design crime actually was voted by you. You've forgotten already. No, oh, yes. I you know. voted this one in the shower curtain. So, Kate, this is what is it about shower cur- curtains? And well, is it a design crime? This is an interesting one because there, there may have been a bit of change of thought. <laughs> um, okay, so what was the starting point? So my starting point was I cannot bear shower curtains. Right. Um, especially when they're over baths, because they wrap themselves around yes. you, they cling to you, they're trying to assassinate you, you're trying to fight your way out past the dampness, you're pulling the thing off the wall, it's just a disaster. And mould. Yes. There you go. That horrible. We've all been in student accommodation, haven't we? And we're all uh, yes. slightly traumatised by the student bathroom with a shower curtain. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Because if you've got a bath, a sort of traditional bath that, that goes against the wall, a fitted bath, mm. then... You could have, although I appreciate it's much more expensive, a glass screen. Well, of course. well this is what replaced the shower curtain. Because used, that used to be your only option. If you didn't have room for the shower screen, or indeed the budget, because that's very yeah, they're expensive. You have the accordion shower partition, which is made of glass, but then goes <laughs> and like accordion closes. Do you remember those? I do not, but oh I'm, my god, accordion shower screens. Down. Yes. So that was kind of in place of the, the shower curtain. If you haven't got room to have a screen and then not be able to get into the bath. But but so so it's a, sometimes you can't kind of help it because your bathroom lends yourself in and that which direction. Which is the position you find yourself in. The position I find myself in. Well, now I was going to say before we talk about the position I am currently in. There's been a lot of attempts over the years to reinvent the shower curtain. Right. And so you now can get beautiful fabric shower curtains which look great from the outside and then you hang a, a liner, don't you? So it's There's not that through. many of those. There's not that many of those. What you can do is buy a plain white one from, you know, John, good old John Lewis or whatever, and make your shower curtain out of your own preferred fabric. Yeah. Whereby the shower plastic shower curtain does the job of keeping the water yeah. inside the shower tray. But the fabric curtain on the outside looks really, really pretty. That's looking. I did this in our last flat. I had that option. It just, you just got potentially two bits of fabric to go mould. It was the only caveat with that. It's difficult, say, in a way, it really yeah. depends what your ventilation is like. But, so I, I've been firmly in this shower curtain as design crime. Having How? said that, just before we move on as well, the quality of shower curtains is hugely is, variable. It's hugely variable, and quality really counts with a good shower yeah. curtain, yeah. especially when it comes to that thing. You know when the air kind of sucks it towards you, and yes, you like the flimsy one? Yeah. So go for a nice that's the heavy, prime. go yeah. for a nice heavy one. And then the other thing I would say is the printed patterns available shower curtains is much better than it's ever been because you can get some really nice jazzy designs. Does that just hide the mould though because you can't see it? <laughs> that's the right one. You I, know, think I, mean, I think with some of them now as well they're like woven fabrics so you can bend them in the washing machine. I think they've come on a bit since. And I think you need to things. hang them to air you know leaving mm. them sort of yes. stuck against the side of the bar <laughs> where there's nowhere at all. But oh, you're painting a I, I was going to talk about how I may have had a change of heart on this because obviously you know, we've moved into this new house mm. and you know it's a bit smaller than the last one and we are going to need to redo the bathroom and upstairs there is a bath with a shower over it's a power shower a power shower a power shower it's very noisy and they're very expensive to run and the water just trickles out of it not a lot of power right. so we've slightly abandoned that and downstairs there is a, a perfectly good shower that works quite well but it's a shower it's a small shower in a small space and it's got a slidey right, a slidey yeah. door across it and because it's small the slidey door doesn't open very far Ooh. and i went in on the first day and my first thought was well if i put on any weight i can't, <laughs> I can't wash it here um and and then you know you like, do not want to get stuck in the <laughs> Shower was installed 20 years ago, yes. you know, it's a bit tired of me to be doing. And he said, 
it's fine. He said, we'll have a shower curtain. Mm -hmm. And I said, don't be ridiculous. We've got to have a shower curtain. And then I thought, ooh, we have the space. Yeah. We have the space to put on all the weight we wanted. <laughs> Places of you know hard tiles, hard yeah, surfaces, straight lines. They do bring yeah. a, a bit of softness. To and it. for me, it's a fabric. It's an opportunity for colour and pattern. So which is tricky in many. In bathrooms. a room that quite often looks like you say plain, flat, bland, hard surfaces, cold. And if you're in a flat, I mean, the first flat we lived in, the bath. The bathroom was internal, so there was no window, Ooh. so there was no. I mean, that's a whole separate issue. But Perfect. it also meant no environment for, for mold. Yes, exactly. That. <laughs> oh well, there is that. But I was coming back to your fabric. Yeah. Thing. You know, if you've got a window to put a curtain or a blind over, you'll, you know, a shower curtain. I think. Yeah, I don't think they're a design crime. I think if you don't keep them clean and let them go mouldy, that's a design crime. If you buy the really cheap, rubbishy ones, mm -hmm. and they, like you say, waft towards you and try and attack you mid-shower. I think it can be done. I think a shower curtain can be done mm -hmm. elegantly if it's designed with well, purpose. If you're really nice, I'll invite you around to see mine. <laughs> Although, a final thought on that, when we moved into our last house, there was a shower curtain over the bath, and the shower curtain was fixed on a kind of pole that suctioned at each end, mm -hmm. and it just fell down. The Ooh, entire time it just came unsuctioned from the wall. Oh, yeah. So, you know, back yeah. to the crime. <laughs> back to the... But I am confident our listeners will have thoughts. Will have thoughts I think curtains. they will have thoughts. I would poise yourself for that Facebook group debate. So tell us what you think. Guilty or not guilty and of course do tell us what you consider oh and of course do tell us what you consider to be design crimes yourself there's of course our facebook group our instagram and even our email address the great indoors pod at gmail.com so no excuse for not getting in touch next time we will be answering your style surgery questions so send them over and for now Thanks so much to our producers, Kate Taylor and Sarah Cudden of Fleece Collective. And thank you so much to you for listening. And we'll see you in the great indoors. Bye. Right, train, run. Yep. Well done, well done. Fast. We could, you should be able to make the five o'clock train. Oh, well done. You, don't, don't worry, guys. don't worry.